Just a quick warning before we begin, there are a couple of curse words that are in the upcoming podcast. Hello and welcome to Startup, the podcast about what it is really like to start a business. I'm Alex Bloomberg, and this is the bonus episode we promised at the end of last season, just a couple of weeks ago. Lisa and Chow had a baby, there was a wedding. Anyway, this episode is going to be focusing entirely on Gimlet, the company that I started to make podcasts, such as the one you're listening to right now. If this is sounding a bit circular, that's not the half of it. Many of you know, but some of you might not. I did a whole podcast series about the starting of this company. It was season one of the Startup Podcast. And just to jog your memories, it started with a disastrous pitch to this big-time investor, Chris Saka. If I were calling an Uber right now, and it said, it's going to be here in two minutes, and that was all the time you had, what are you doing? So I'm making a network of digital podcasts uh, that we will monitor, that, that will, that will, that is going to meet. <laughs> Sorry. Let's start again. Two minutes, right? All right. <laughs> so it didn't start well. But gradually, slowly, over the season, things got better. We did get investors. I teamed up with my co-founder, Matt Lieber. We found an office, built a studio, launched two new shows, Reply All and Mystery Show, and a new season of Startup, which you just finished listening to, presumably. And this brings us to the present day, a little over a year after I made that first pitch to Chris Saka. Where do things stand right now? Where, what, what, are, what does our financial picture look like right now? Our financial picture? Yeah. Um... This is Matt Lieber, my co-founder. I dragged him into the studio to share what in most companies would be proprietary information about how the business is doing. <laughs> you hate talking about this, don't you? I don't like to talk about it so spe- I'm sorry, like I don't like to get so specific about it because I'm afraid of getting judged. <laughs> Does that mean you don't want to tell us what how much money we made this year or how much money we're on track to make this year? Well, what do you th- I mean, you're the CEO. What do you think? <laughs> I think this is definitely one of those things where at first I was like, I wanted to brag about it, but then I talked to one kind of quote unquote expert and they were like, yeah, I wouldn't share that. And now I have that person's like voice in my head. What was that quote unquote expert saying? What was the reason that he, he was share? like, I don't think he's like, I think you should keep your numbers pretty closely held because what happens is once you put them out there, you lose control of the story and it can come back. And even though it looks good now, it can like not look as good later. And then you aren't able to like, um, tell your own story. Right. But you're like, but I, I want to use this to tell our story. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what we're doing is telling our own story. <laughs> so here is that story. During the first season of Startup, you might recall, we raised a million and a half dollars. Over the last 10 months or so, we've used that money to rent office space, build out a studio, hire people. We're now at 19 employees and growing. We'll have 25 by the end of the year. We have three shows up and running now, a bunch more in development. And our financial picture... If I open up our bank account right now. We have just under $900,000 in the bank account. Mm-hmm. Um, How much money do you think we're going to bring in by the end of this year? In this year, uh, we'll probably do just under $2 million. Uh, And then what are we going to spend this year? We'll probably spend around $2 million or a little more than $2 million. If you're doing the math at home, that means that we're spending exactly as much as we're bringing in. Actually, a little bit more. Which, at this point in the business, we expect it. Lots of startups spend aggressively, especially in the beginning. What we did not expect is that we would be at this level of audience or staff or number of shows. We didn't think we'd be spending this much money, and we definitely didn't think we'd be making this much. And today, we're going to talk about how we make that money, advertising, and why making money from advertising, even more money than you ever expected, is complicated. And we're going to be unveiling a somewhat scary and bold experiment at the end of this podcast, so stick around. All right, we're rolling. So let's start here at a recent Gimlet Media all-staff meeting. Somewhere around a dozen of us are sitting in our makeshift conference room on the used couches that came with the space we're renting in downtown Brooklyn. And the thing that started off this conversation that made us pull out the recorders and start taping was one advertisement in particular, an ad that ran on the Gimlet podcast Reply All, a show about the internet. Here's the ad. This week's episode of Reply All is brought to you by the Microsoft Outlook app for your mobile device. 
iOS or Android. Stay connected and productive with a clear, unified view of your emails, calendars, contacts, and files. You can manage mail quickly and easily, or schedule messages you want to handle later. The Reply All crew was planning on sticking with our old email apps, but Matt Lieber, co-founder of Gimlet and the most organized man we know, convinced us to switch. Yeah, like I think it's a good app. Like I, I, I'm, I look at these things pretty analytically, and I've converted five people at Gimlet to using it, um, and all of them are still using it. And an unnamed tech journalist who emailed you this week was using it. Very yeah, prominent. like the hottest tech journalist had the little outlook in his signature. Do you hear that? If you want to be an early adopter, like Matt Lieber, and a very prominent unnamed tech journalist, and me and PJ, now is the time to make the leap. Download the Outlook app for free for iOS or Android. That's the okay, Microsoft so that Outlook ad app. had run on Wednesday's episode of Reply All. In my head, but at our story meeting on Friday, two days later, the hosts, Alex Goldman and PJ Vote, were feeling weird about it. Here's Alex. You'll hear PJ chime in in a second. I think now that I'm having this conversation, I'm having like a tiny panic attack. I'm feeling so anxious about this it. This is where I've been trying to give you this panic attack for three months. Like, I keep telling you I feel worried, and you're like, eh, it's fine, it's fine. I, I would say that uh, the panic attacks you were having about other ads, like, they felt much less in Dorsey to me than this one does. So that word he said, in Dorsey, here's what he means. He's saying that the Microsoft ad had crossed this line in his mind from a simple advertisement to an actual endorsement. Now, it's entirely possible that this is a meaningless distinction to you. And it was a meaningless distinction to several of us at that meeting. But to others of us, it was a real thing. And to understand what made it real, Let's listen to the other ad that ran in that same episode of Reply All. This week's episode of Reply All is also brought to you by MailChimp, the online email marketing solution. If you've been listening to this show for a while, you probably know that MailChimp has been giving away these cool action figures of their mascot, Freddy, through our show. And it's that time again. We actually have a bunch of them on our desk, and I have a habit of, like, moving them just a little bit every night before I leave work. Do you think that they might be magic and moving of their own volition? I'll tell you something. Did you ever read the book The Indian in the Cupboard? Yes. So you know that it's a book about toys coming to life? Mm Mm-hmm. When I was a kid, anytime I would read a book that had sort of fantastical elements, I would want them to be true so bad. So after I read that book, I would pretend I was sleeping all the time to try to catch my toys coming to life. Oh, my God. This I've never felt more fond of you than I do right now. I never caught them. (laughs) If I caught them, I'd probably be a really different person today. There's magic in those Freddies. Go to MailChimp.com slash Reply All to get your free Freddy and do it quickly because they go very fast. And I should say here, first, we've played two ads and, and we're talking about some of our sponsors. But I should be clear, we are not getting any money from any advertisers as part of this podcast. So the MailChimp ad, it mentioned MailChimp. PJ and Alex said that you could get a cool monkey doll if you go to the MailChimp website. And there was a funny digression about PJ and his adorable dreams when he was a kid. But there was no personal endorsement of MailChimp. There was no one from Gimlet saying, use MailChimp, it's awesome. I use MailChimp, it's awesome. You should too. In other words, there was none of this. Yeah, like I think it's a good app. Like I, I, I'm, I look at these things pretty analytically, and I've converted five people at Gimlet to using it, um, and all of them are still using it. And an, uh, Almost all the ads we do are more like the MailChimp ad. And that Microsoft ad with its endorsement to PJ and Alex, it just wasn't sitting right. Even though it was true, Matt did like the app, and he wouldn't have said so otherwise. And it may sound weird to you that they felt comfortable exploiting their early childhood memories on behalf of an advertiser, but not comfortable saying their true feelings about an email app that we actually use. This is the murky world of advertiser ethics that we now inhabit. And in this murky world, it was the fact that Matt was telling the truth, weirdly, that made it so problematic to PJ and Alex. They have no problem reading ad copy that glowingly describes a product or service, because there it's clear they're just saying the words they're paid to say. But when you use your own words in an ad, the fact that it's in an ad can actually work against you. Because, as PJ said, what if next week he discovered something that he really hated about that Outlook app? I wouldn't come back in an ad spot and be like, you know, I used Outlook for a couple more weeks and uh, uh, I just stopped using it. I don't know why. Just wanted to let you guys know. (laughs) Brought you by Outlook. (laughs) Brought you by Outlook. Yeah. It's like we're trying to talk about how to make objective advertisements. Like you can't. PJ and Alex's misgivings about that Outlook ad had started extending back to another set of ads they'd done 
that had included a personal endorsement. This was a set of ads they did for a company called Slack. PJ and Alex were both Slack users long before Slack came to us as an advertiser. And so they had felt fine saying, we use Slack, here's why we like it. Well, at the time anyway. And now like I'm like, oh, this is what people mean when they say slippery slope. Like, I really like Slack. I really, really do. I really use it every single day. And it and it's like, well, why wouldn't you fucking say that? Like, why? What, this meta podcast brought to you by Slack. <laughs> I mean, they they have a great promo code that you could use. Like, why? Like, why would you not? Who does it serve to not say that? But then the answer is like, well, it doesn't serve you. Two weeks later, when Slack goes and does something great that you want to say something about, but then it looks like you're a shill or terrible that you want to say something about, like it, it feels like it undermines my ability to like you know, be a journalist, basically. After all, PJ and Alex are doing a show about the internet. Microsoft, Slack, these are companies that they could easily be covering. And, you know, we can tell you till we're blue in the face, we would never avoid a story or not report a story because it reflected negatively on an advertiser. But why do something in an ad that would create doubt about that? All right. Oh, wow, this makes me... Back in the staff meeting, PJ and Alex and all of us, to a certain extent, had this feeling like maybe this ice we're walking on, it's not so thick after all. It's not like I think one day I'm going to wake up and I'm going to be wearing a suit that's like... Uh, You'd be like a NASCAR driver covered in... Blazoned with, with endorsement. But like, it's just uh, knowing where we're comfortable. And unfortunately, six months in, we still don't know where that is. Right, and like the only, like so far, our policy has been mildly ironic distance. Like yeah. that has basically been the thing. Is like we're just saying we're saying these words for money, but we're not actually endorsing it. And that's like it's been tone. Like our policy is tone <laughs> right now. And like, and maybe that's all we need. Maybe we just need a tone. But I feel like we need something more. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that is scary. That feels very slippery. I know. I was naive about advertising when I started this company. I knew that ads were going to be a key part of us making money, and I knew that we were doing journalism. And I figured we would just work it out, avoid the pitfalls that are always around when advertising supports journalism. The appearance of conflict, or even worse, actual conflict. I figured lots of other for-profit journalistic organizations manage to avoid these pitfalls just fine. They work it out in different ways, but they all seem to manage to do good journalism and, in some cases, make money. But honestly, advertising came with complications I never imagined. And it's been a continuous process of making mistakes and then coming up with solutions to those mistakes. For example, early on, we did some ads for Squarespace, where we talked to people who had Squarespace websites, including one eight-year-old boy who had a Minecraft site. But we forgot to tell the boy or his mother that we were interviewing him for an ad. His mother got angry when she found out. And then people pointed out online that, hey, you know, we're making money from these ads, but we're not paying the people who appear in those ads. So now I make a point before each advertisement interview I do of saying something like the following. So uh, before we begin, I just want to get a couple things uh, on tape. I'm recording for possible broadcast. Yes. This is an interview I did for a recent advertisement. I was interviewing the woman who uses the product that we were advertising uh, for possible broadcast on a commercial. Mm-hmm. You are aware of that? Yes. You are also aware that uh, even though we are going to get money for airing this commercial, you're going to see none of that. Yes. You're doing this entirely for free. Yes. So on the one hand, advertising, it's a bit of a minefield. On the other hand, it does pay the bills. In the studio, Matt brought that up with PJ and Alex. Just a note, Alex was on Skype, so that's why he sounds different. Um, this, this year, the show is probably going to sell somewhere on the order of seven or $800,000 worth of advertising against Reply All. Um, f- to go to uh, next- can, we, can we stop for a second and just say, holy shit? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> that's Absolutely. ridiculous. That's awesome. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, look, we're, you guys have... You've kind of gone into business here, and business is like wait what? <laughs> it introduces complexities, I guess, and and comprom- and trade offs and compromises. I'm not saying. And as if on cue, in the middle of this conversation, 
an email arrived in my inbox. Can I just the like, other? Can I just break in here for one? Go ahead. One moment, just to tell you, like literally, the thing that arrived in my inbox right now. Oh no! Twelve minutes ago, three o four p.m. Joe Nocera. Who's Joe Nocera? <laughs> He's a Times business columnist. Yeah. Subject line: Your <laughs> podcast ads. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> I find them extremely interesting. Possible grist for column. Can we talk about them? No. Exclamation point. No. Oh. God, that really makes me feel queasy. Hello? Hey, Joe. Third time's the charm. This is Joe Nocera. It was the third time I'd called him. I hadn't had a cable plugged in, and he couldn't hear me the first two times. Anyway, I told him I'd talk to him as long as I could record our conversation for this podcast. He said, fine. So here we were. He told me he'd got the idea to talk to us from his son, who'd recommended the startup podcast to him. So I listened to it, and it was very interesting, but the thing that blew me away were the ads. Uh Uh-huh. And I kept wondering about their journalistic propriety and... It was kind of a throwback to the 1950s and 60s when, you know, the pitch men would be the announcers. Right. Except that you did it more interactively. You used that whole faux hesitation thing that you guys have perfected. <laughs> it's not faux, man. It's not faux. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. From Ira Glass to Planet Money to Gimlet. Uh, yeah. so, uh, so I just kind of want to think about what, and here you talk about um, whether it, why it doesn't cross any lines that shouldn't be crossed and that kind of thing. Joe and I talked for a while, and I told him that as podcasts go, we're not that unusual. The vast majority of podcasts, from public radio podcasts to comedy podcasts to sports podcasts, the hosts read the ads. And many podcasts, the hosts actively endorse the product, talk about using it and loving it. And I told him that at the very moment he wrote to us, we were in the middle of a big conversation about what exactly our hosts felt comfortable doing and not doing. So basically, do you view this as something you're still kind of struggling with? Or do you feel like you've got parameters now that you're comfortable with? Or kind of where are you on that? We are. So I I think it's something that like. Uh, no, we're still we're still struggling with it a little bit. We're still trying to figure out what it is because we're journalists, right. and if this sort of like does anything to call into question that, uh, like I know it's not affecting us in any way, but that doesn't matter. Like if it feels to people like it is, then that's a then then that's a then that's a problem. So yeah, I, I, we're still trying to figure it out. Um, so am I. It's uh, you know I guess. What do you think? You know, one, I'm not 100 percent sure what I think. I mean, I know that I have long thought that journalists uh, didn't really shouldn't that journalists couldn't really afford to be pure as the driven snow all the time. Just in the sense that you know somebody has to bring home the bacon, yeah. and you know we can't be just sitting there saying, well, you know, our hands are are are, unta- are undirty or or, or untainted. Um, because that's somebody else's problem. Because ultimately, it's it, if this profession's going to last, it, it's something you got to think about. And you know, at the times we're doing an awful lot to draw from social media and try and attract advertising in various different ways. And while the journalists themselves are not participating in it, um, we're certainly thinking about it a lot more. And a lot of the divisions between the business side and the editorial side are are slowly crumbling. Mm-hmm. And not in a bad way, but you know, I guess I'm in the same situation you are. It's like I can defend everything we do. Um, but, you know, I guess I wonder if there's a line to be crossed. I know that I would personally feel uncomfortable if I were doing what you're doing. Right. Um, but, you know, I'm a 63-year-old journalist who's been doing this for my whole life and, and, and have never really uh, participated in the advertising side of our business, even though I know it's important. I I wouldn't be surprised if like once we become a like a lot of it really is like you're a startup and like w- everything is brand new and there's not enough bodies on hand to do anything, um, but uh, 
but I wouldn't be surprised if like, you know, if we, you know, once we're a more mature company, we do have like, we have a division that's only, that right. only does the ads. And then we, and then the people who are doing the journalism and the people who are doing the ads don't meet. Maybe the people who are doing the ads talk to the host about like, hey, we want you to read this and this. Do you feel comfortable with that? That's probably the place that it, that it will ever uh, eventually end up. And, and that would probably be fine. But this is, yeah, no, it's, we're in the I, brand new world. You know what I mean? Right. Like this is, this is like a, like this is a brand new media company. Media companies need to make money, and 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 advertisers want to reach people, and that's the, and those two things by themselves are not bad. And like, can we just sort of make it so that like it's it's like you know it's right. as above board as possible? It does seem like it's d- a difficult thing to say. Back in the studio, PJ, Alex, Matt, and I did come to one small decision about how to make things as above board as possible. That Microsoft Outlook ad, BJ and Alex decided they didn't want to do any more like that. It feels sort of like not a path we really want to go down. Like no more like saying it, like we like this thing. Yeah. Like we can, you can talk about it. You can give the copy. You can read the copy that they want you to read if it feels okay. But like you, you're not going to sort of say we personally endorse this. Even if you do personally endorse it, you're not going to say that. Yeah. That felt fine. No endorsements. Except now they had to make a new Microsoft ad. The one they'd already recorded for that week's show was feeling too endorsey. And the problem was that Microsoft had already heard that one, and now Matt was going to have to go back to Microsoft and tell them, hey, we're swapping out that ad for a new one that we're making. PJ asked Matt, how's that going to go? My fear is just like Outlook. You'll send them what we make, and they'll be like, we like this one less. They won't say, like, we want you to endorse more. They'll just be like, this one we like less. Yeah, the and other that's what one, they'll say. And I'll say, okay, is it still? Are we good to go on it? Yeah, I guess you can run it. Okay, we'll run it. And then when I go back again and say, hey, there's we just got more spots open in December. Do you guys want them? They may be slightly less likely to say yes. That's okay. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I mean, that's fine. There's one other problem with advertising. It's a business problem. I'm not sure the money will keep flowing. Right now, advertising rates are high, but historically, they've fluctuated quite a bit. One big economic downturn and ad budgets are usually the first to go. The companies who are lining up to advertise on our shows right now, they might evaporate or decide they're willing to pay us, but just a lot less. Look what happened to newspapers, right? And in that scenario, our full bank account could start looking a lot less full. And that full bank account, we have big plans for it. We have a bunch more shows in development. We're hiring a lot more people to make those shows. And we need to move into a new office with new studios so that those people can have a place to work. This is a long way of saying, I like making money from advertisers, but I don't like only making money from advertisers. It's Business 101, which by now even I understand, you need to diversify your revenue base. But there's something else going on here, which is, for me, even more important. We don't make these shows for our advertisers. We make them for you, the listener. And making them for you, but having advertisers pay for them, there is something a little complicated and kludgy about that, you know? And there's something a lot more straightforward about having at least some of the money come from the people we make the shows for. And so that's what I'm going to end this podcast by proposing. We've been working for months now to make this experiment we're about to try possible. And now we're ready. Starting today... You can join Gimlet as a paying member. And I should say up front, this is not a paywall, if any of you were thinking that. We will keep our shows free, supported by ads. But now, if you want, also supported by you. Something voluntary. And here's how it'll work. If you join Gimlet as a paying member, it costs five bucks a month, and you become part of what grows and sustains what we're building here, but also you get stuff for that money. And one of the most exciting things to me that you get is exclusive early access to brand new shows that we're making. So if you think about what goes on behind the scenes here, we have a bunch of new shows in development. And the way we develop these new shows is we make pilots of them, sort of prototypes, right, to see how they sound. And if you join Gimlet as a paying member, we send you a password-protected link delivered to your inbox that you can click on and then hear the pilots long before anyone else does. You get to actually hear what we're cooking up in our kitchen. And what's cool about this, I can tell you, these pilots, they often change quite a bit before they find their way onto the air. So you're really getting a sneak peek at how we make things here, how they change from initial conception to final form. 
We have one pilot ready to go. It's a show we're developing with Adam Davidson, a New York Times Magazine columnist and my old partner in crime at Planet Money, and with Adam McKay, writer, director, and producer, known for movies like Anchorman, Talladega Nights, Step Brothers. They're teaming up to do a show called Awesome Boring, where they take a topic that seems boring and reveal it to be secretly awesome. It's funny, informative, and I love it. And we're planning to launch the series to the public somewhere before the end of 2015. But if you join Gimlet, you can listen to the pilot episode right now. There's more that will come. If you join Gimlet as a paying member, we'll send three or four links to pilots a year. There's other stuff you'll get too. What's the thing they used to say? But wait, there's more? I feel like I'm on a KTEL commercial. Anybody remember that? Anyway, there's other stuff you'll get too. T-shirts, naturally. If you pay the whole year up front, you'll get a soft cotton T-shirt with the logo of your Gimlet show of choice on it. And there's a bunch of stuff that you'll get that I can't tell you about right now because we haven't come up with it yet. Our plan is to invent new stuff to give to the people who join. It could be something like invitations to behind-the-scenes chats with our hosts or funny videos that we come up with or pre-sale access to live events that we've got going. We want to try to invent stuff that our paying members will enjoy. So if that sounds exciting to you, we would love it for you to join. Go to GimletMedia.com and click Join Gimlet in the upper right-hand corner. If you click that link, you can also see these funny videos we made to explain what this membership thing is. We film them here in our actual office. GimletMedia.com. Click on the Join Gimlet button in the upper right-hand corner. It's like a promo code for ourselves. This is really the last episode of Startup for a while. Lisa and Caitlin are hard at work figuring out which company we're going to follow for season three. We'll be back in a couple months with a special startup mini-series where we'll revisit some of the people that we met in season one. Subscribe to our email list at the website, GimletMedia.com, or follow us on Twitter, at Podcast Startup. All right, a couple of housekeeping details. If this is the first time you're listening to Startup, I want to let you know that this is not a typical episode. There's a whole story in season one of Startup about how this podcast and Gimlet Media, the producer of this podcast, got started. There's also a season two of Startup, where we follow two young women trying to build a company in the competitive world of online dating. Also, we have other podcasts. We have Reply All. We talked all about it in this episode. We also have another show called Mystery Show. They're both great. You can find them wherever fine podcasts are distributed. Also, our very own Reply All host, PJ and Alex, will take the stage in a live show in New York City. The show is called Cast Party. It's them and a bunch of great other great podcasts, Invisibilia, Radio Lab. That's happening on Tuesday, July 28th. Get your tickets at castparty.org. This will be an event. And if you're screaming at your mobile device, yes, 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 I know all this. I've subscribed to all these podcasts. I've bought my tickets. Rest assured, we've got more shows coming soon that even you haven't heard of yet. It's all in the works. This episode was reported and edited and produced by me and Caitlin Roberts. Our editor was Caitlin Kenny. The startup website was designed in partnership with the Design Commission. Mark Phillips wrote and performed our theme song. Build Buildings wrote and performed our special ad music. The Reverend John Delore mixed the episode. This episode of Startup and the previous season of Startup featured brand new original music written and performed by our own John Delore, along with his bandmates, Jordan Scanella, Sam Merrick, Asama McGregor, John Lado, and Dominic Falacaro. Their band name, hotmoms.gov. To subscribe to this podcast, go to iTunes and subscribe to Startup or check out the Gimlet Media website, gimletmedia.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Podcast Startup or you can follow me at Abex Lumber.